thank you very much. Um, I must admit, I haven't actually planned to what I was going to say today. And um, Sophie then gave me a rundown of uh, what she promised that I would tell you. <laughs> so uh, I feel a little bit, uh, not under pressure, but it's a little bit, I have no idea what might happen today, so let's, let's see. But what I would like to try to do, because when I start speaking, I don't stop. So the translator is going to have a hard job, so you're going to have to help me to make sure that I take care of her. <laughs> Благодаря. Трябва да призная, че нямам план какво ще ви кажа тази вечер и преди да дойдем тук с описа за смитали списък с нещата, които обещала, че аз ще ви кажа. Освен това, когато започна да говоря, трудно се спирам, така че моля ви да ви помагате да ми напомняте, че трябва да спирам, за да може тачка да не се спаря. И следващия чаленч е, че аз да ви очаквам да ви очаквам от вас, and if I just speak for the full two hours, I'm not going to have a chance to actually ask you and answer your questions. So at some point, let's say maybe in an hour, make me stop talking <laughs> so that I can actually answer what you, whatever it is you want to come back with. But um, yeah, maybe at least one hour. And maybe you can like prompt me when I. Okay. Great. So wow. Um, so the talk apparently is about permaculture. So I guess the first thing we can establish is well. What is it that you know about permaculture, and why is it you're here? What is it you want to learn? What is it you want to pick up from today? So there's obviously a lot of people, so I'm not going to ask you all individually. So maybe we can find some way to try and elicit some information with you collaboratively. So maybe the easiest way is um, if I ask you some questions, and if this applies to you, I'll ask you to stand up. So maybe the first question is who has Who's got a, a diploma in permaculture? <laughs> yep, wow, great. Three, four, fantastic. Who has uh, at least studied a permaculture design course, i.e. a 10-day or a 12-day course? Stand up so I can see who you are. Great. <laughs> Excellent. And who's at least done an introduction course, you know, two or one or two days course, at least some kind of introduction, stand up. <coughs> okay, great. So, the rest of you, how many of you have heard of permaculture before it was written on the, on the promotion that, you know, for you to come here today? If you have heard of it before, stand up. <laughs> okay. Cool. Great. And uh, is there anyone who's never even heard of it and has just kind of accidentally turned up here thinking this is some kind of cult meeting where or something? I don't know. So one person. All right. Two. Great. <laughs> oh, a few more. <laughs> okay. Well, welcome to our cult. It's. Um, um, okay, so how many of you think permaculture is about um, food growing? Okay. Okay, so quite a few of you. 
How many of you have heard of permaculture from the social aspect? Uh, how you can apply permaculture to meet social needs? Great. Okay, so we've got a nice balance there. That's great. So, um, maybe I can start with a little bit of the... It, does anyone need me to maybe go through the history of permaculture, just briefly? Just to kind of set the context of what permaculture is, or can we move on? Okay, there's one, a few people. Okay, so let's begin with you. Okay, so let's start at the beginning. Um, so, I guess, the, the, uh, for me, the first thing is permaculture, or any system, is a solution to a problem. So I guess the first question we are, can ask is what is the problem that permaculture is trying to solve? So the problem or the challenge is uh, who's heard of um, the Limits to Growth, a book called The Limits to Growth. Okay, just a couple of people. So The Limits to Growth was a, a publication where several uh, leading economists, uh, politicians and statisticians got together. To look at the relationship between the world's resources, population growth, food, economies, etc., etc. And what they saw is that there's one resource that has been responsible for our community's ability to grow so fast and to be able to feed so many people. <coughs> but this resource, because it's allowed us to mechanize so many things, is also the limiting factor because it's a finite resource. What do you think that resource might be? <coughs> Oil. Oil. Petroleum, oil. It has been, an, you know, in the years since we've uh, discovered it and discovered how to make use of it, we have used it in so many imaginative ways. Now, we've used it to um, increase our ability to grow foods, we've used it to... Um, to be able to build houses, we've used it to, to, to make so many different things so much easier for human beings. We've also used it for a lot of nonsense as well. But because this is such a finite resource, and because it's becoming harder and harder for us to actually extract this oil, it means that the oil, the price of oil is always going, is going to rise, it's going to get more and more costly to extract and therefore the price of oil will rise, therefore the cost of our living will also increase. But more importantly, there will come a point in time when this resource will be so hard to find that it will almost be, uh, well, we just won't be able to use it for much longer. So, this, um, this concept of us eventually running out of oil um, and how we're using it for inappropriate uses stimulated a lot of people into thinking, wow, how do we kind of transition our societies to stop being completely dependent on oil? 
Идеята, че използваме петрола за глупав начин и че един ден просто няма да има повече петрол, е накарала някои хора да започнат да мислят как, как да намерим друг, как, как да, да спрем да сме зависими от него. So one of those um, uses of oil was in the production of food. So, okay, where, how and where do we use petroleum in the production of our food? Where is it used? <laughs> Machines, packaging, transportation, fertilizers. I mean, right from the beginning, you know, from harvesting seeds, drying seeds, transporting them, planting them. To then growing them, taking care of them, putting fertilizers, putting you know, uh, different growth hormones, well, not growth hormones, but artificial um, nutrients, you know, NKP. To then harvesting it, to drying it, to packaging it, to transporting it, every single part of, this, of food is so nowadays dependent on fossil fuels. So that was the kind of initial uh, stimulus to thinking, well, how can we reduce our dependency on oil in our food production? I mean, and this is not even considering the other implications of the quality of the food that we're then producing, the lack of nutrients, the toxicity that's in our food, all of that was then a kind of secondary consideration. So as I say, so many people started to look at what kind of solutions, and in particular, there was one teacher called Bill Mollison who was teaching conventional agriculture. We wanted to look at well, how can we transition, uh, how, can I, how can I be teaching people to, uh, you know, okay, let's start again. How can, he, he basically in his heart he realised what he was teaching was wrong and it was going to lead humanity into destruction. So he stepped away from it and then started to think, well, how can I do this differently? So he started to come up with different ideas of looking at, well, why is it that we need fossil fuels? How, what is it that we can do, how is it we can replace the work of what we're doing with fossil fuels with different ways of, different ways of working, i.e. the way that we used to do it in the past. <coughs> he then started to teach some of these ideas and one of his students, who also happened to be a uh, living in his community, also started to come up with really interesting ideas. Between them they started looking at, well, how is it that nature is able to create self-maintaining systems? What, what is it that nature does in order to create, for example, a forest or a, um, or yeah, how does it maintain its meadows? How does it maintain different ecosystems? 
а, те са запитали как природата поддържа устойчиви системи, как природата поддържа своите а, поля, например. And from analyzing that and extracting information, they extracted various principles of how nature works. Те наблюдавали това и извлекли някои принципи за начина по който природата работи. They then went and started studying indigenous populations who they deemed were in living in harmony with their surroundings as well as in harmony with each other. Тогава те отчисли при корени населения, местни населения, за които смятали, че живеят в хармония с природата. So from that they extracted certain ethics that these indigenous peoples um, how they lived and it extracted a series of well, in, originally there were four ethics that they lived by. Which is anyone who's actually studied permaculture will see that the last two ethics are now kind of merged into one ethic. Всеки, който е учил пермакултура, ще види, че последните две етики са се слели в една. So those ethics are, well, what are they? What are the three ethics? Кои са трите етики? Earth care. People care. And fair share. Споделена на изобилието. So, what's earth care? Какво е грижа за земята? What is earth care? It's in the sentence. It's taking care of the earth, making sure that you look after the planet and its whole environment. Съдържа се в фразата. Това е да се грижиш за земята, за цялата система, цялата околна среда. But how it's used? It's it's used as an analysis tool for every decision that you make. Но както го използваме за да анализираме всяко so when you're making a decision, you have to check, am I, whatever system it is I'm working with, if I do it this way, does it actually enrich the earth or does it deprive the earth? So am I making the environment richer and more productive and more harmonious, or am I depriving the environment of of its ability to take care of itself? So that's earth care. So what is people care then? What's people care? Isn't it obvious? Care for the people! Exactly, thank you very much. So, first of all, it's about taking care of you. Now that might sound very selfish, but if you can't take care of yourself and your own needs, how can you genuinely, honestly, compassionately take care of someone else? Първо, това означава да се погрижим за себе си и може да ви звучи малко егоистично, но ако не се погрежиш за себе си, как може да изпитваш състрадание и да помагаш на другите? So people care is first of all about understanding what your needs are. Това тази етика грижа за хората е на първо място е за това да разбереш своите собствени нужди. And by needs we're very clearly distinguishing between our needs and our greeds. И тук трябва много ясно да различим какви са ни нуждите и какво е отвъд нуждите, какво е просто желание общност. So once you understand what your real needs are, and your real needs I would classify as things like food, clothing, water or protection, uh, these are the things that if you do without, you die. Та нуждите са основните неща, храна, подслон, дрехи, защита, това са нещата, без които не може да съществуваме. Then beyond that, you can then go on how do I now create a quality of life. So with quality of life, we can then start looking at things like companionship, sense of worth, uh, you know, some kind of direction, some kind of purpose. 
В това може да, да търсим подобрение на качеството на живота, като да намериш партньор. Companionship, so friendship, companionship, uh, sense of sense of worth, some sense of purpose. И някакво усещане за 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 цел, за 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 значимост. And I would say that anything else is then a luxury. А бих казал, че всичко отвъд това е просто лукс. So if you actually look and you analyze what it takes to actually meet your real needs, your food, shelter, water, air. It's actually, there's not much, you know, we can actually achieve this quite easily. If we start looking at the things that we need to make our lives better quality, again, a lot of these things are quite easily achievable and not necessarily with money. There is achievable through community, through friends, through companionship. И ако се замислим за това какво ни е нужно за да подобрим качеството на живота си, отново това не са трудно постижими неща. Може да ги постигнем в общността, чрез приятелството. And yet we seem to be spending, uh, yet most people seem to be, or rather the system is educating us to think that all these other things that aren't in the category that we've just described are the things that we really should be chasing for. And these are the things that we then really need to work extra amount of hours and do all kinds of things that we don't necessarily agree with or want to do in order to get all these extra luxuries. Извън тези две категории, които сега описахме, са всъщност нещата, за които ние трябва да се трудим и наистина да се стараем да получим. Тези луксове са нещата, които трябва да преследваме. Say, the system brainwashes us into thinking that these are the things that we really need in order to make our lives good. These are the things that we need to make our lives fulfilled. And yet when we actually get them and achieve them, it's empty. And it doesn't actually fulfill our lives. Системата ни промива мозъците, за да ни накара да мислим, че тези са нещата, които наистина искаме, от които наистина имаме нужда. И когато ги постигнем, всъщност ние не получаваме удовлетворение. So people care, for me, is about, first of all, meeting my basic needs and meeting uh, the things that will then create, give me a better quality of life in such a way that I don't harm anyone else, I don't deprive anyone else of their ability, but ideally, if I can be actually enriching someone else's life by meeting my needs, if I can enrich animals, insects, the planet, etc., um, that for me is people care. It's about taking care of myself in such a way that I also take care of other people. За мен грижа за хората е а, да задоволя базовите си нужди и да подобря качеството си на живот, но по такъв начин, че а, не лишавам а, никого от нещо, а обратното обогатявам а, живота на хората. So that's so earth care about taking care of the earth. And again, as I say, it's about taking care of the earth and in every step, in every decision you make, it's about making sure that you enrich your environment. People care is about taking care of your needs in such a way that you also take care of everyone else's needs. А грижа за хората е това да се погрижиш за себе си, но по такъв начин, че да, да се погрижиш и за нуждите на всички останали. And fair share, the, the third principle, or third ethic, sorry, is about, it's just the, the practice by which you ensure that you achieve the first two. 
споделена на изобилие до третата етика на пермакултурата е просто стъпката, в която се подсигуряваш, че постигаш първите две, че правиш, прилагаш първите две етики. It's the ethic that ensures that whatever you take out of the system, you reinvest more in, back into the system than is needed to keep it going. And by investing more back into the system, it becomes richer. So it's the idea that, um, okay, so for example, a lot of people talk about sustainability. And for me, sustainability is absolute nonsense. The word itself, and I don't know how you're going to translate this, but the word itself, sustainability, sustainable, is a very, very weak word. <laughs> so imagine, if, I, if you were to ask me how my marriage is, and I was to say, my marriage is sustainable, <laughs> <laughs> How does that sound? That doesn't sound rich and alive and abundant and full of life. It's not resilient. It's not amazing. It's sustainable. <laughs> so sustainable is about doing something that just about barely allows it to keep going. But it doesn't allow for shock. When, a, when something unexpected happens and there's a shock, sustainable doesn't compensate for that. So a system that can't withstand shock, as soon as this shock happens, and shock will happen at some stage, it crumbles and it fails. So fair share is about making sure that you invest into the system far more than the system needs to take care of itself and exist. You in insert way more than it needs so that it becomes richer and stronger and stronger and can then withstand shock. Споделяне на изобилието означава, че инвестираме много, в системата много повече, отколкото тя се нуждае и така подсигуряваме, че тя ще бъде по-силна и ще може да е издържана на шокове. Окей, so permaculture is about taking care of our human needs. Пермакултурата е за това да се грижим за своите човешки нужди. But it's about taking care of our needs in such a way that we also take care of everyone else's needs, we take care of the needs of the planet, etc, etc. Now, its history started off in agriculture, looking at how to, take care, how to create uh, rich food growing systems that did not rely on fossil fuels. Исторически погледнато, пермакултурата започва с замеделието, с търсенето на начин да отглеждаме храна без да сме зависими от горивото петро. And it did that by first of all understanding how nature works and how nature creates resilience and abundance. И за да разберат как се случва това, да хората трябва да разберат как So these principles are used to look at every system that you want to design, i.e. Uh, initially around growing food, and how you apply the same principles that nature uses to take care of itself in our food growing systems. So, I knew this would happen eventually. I never ever remember what I say. Um, so permaculture, um, Actually, what did I say? Help me out. Help me out, please.
облак замеделен, и да видим как можем да го приложим във всички останали области на нашия живот. Е, да, в чай са Now I don't know where I was, actually. <laughs> um, okay, so permaculture, yeah, use permaculture principles to design, yeah, permaculture, you design food growing systems based on how nature uh, takes care of itself and how it creates richness and abundance. Създавате системи за отглеждане на храна по модела на природата, по модела, по който природата използва, за да подсигури изобилие. And from a social and human perspective, it's underpinned by ethics, which help us to continuously check that we are doing it in a way that continuously creates richness and abundance. Освен това е подплатена с етики, които подсигуряват, че това, което правим, ще продължава и ще е етично. So, as I say, so originally these principles were used to evolve and look at how to create rich food growing systems, but the principles are so clear, they are so simple, that they are adaptable and usable in so many different scenarios. Оригинално принципите тръгват от земеделието, но те са приложими в много различни сценарии. So, so taking these same permaculture principles, you can use it to meet almost any human need. Тези пермакултурни принципи могат да се използват за да отговарят на почти всяка, за да отговарят на почти всяка човешка нужда. So for example, um, building a house. So, how can you build a house which uh, um, which works along permaculture principles? So, one of the first principles, one of the first ecological principles, is about flow of energy. So, you think about what? energy is flowing into my house. Where does this energy enter into my system, into my house? What does it bring with it? Can I make use of this energy? Or do I want to get rid of this energy? How does it affect my house? How does it then leave my house? When it leaves, what does it take with it? Do I want to stop it from taking this energy out? Or do I want to try and hold on to this energy? So what kind of energies? Could we look at? Give me an energy that passes through your house. Sunlight. Okay. So let's imagine. Um, okay. So do you want to hold sun? What, what? What? When sun comes into the house, what does it do to the house? It warms it up. So do you want the sun to warm your house up? It depends on the season. So when it's 40 degrees outside, do you really want sun to be heating your house? Okay, so you need to consider uh, when the sun comes in, let's, let's imagine it's winter. Um, so you want the sun to actually shine into your house. So the heat comes in, but the heat can also quite easily escape. So you consider where does it come in from and where does it leave from. And in the winter, do you really want this heat to leave? Not really. So you imagine, well, how can I hold on to and trap this heat for as long as possible? 
мислите как мога да привличам тази енергия и да я запазя за възможно най-долго. So what tricks can we use to hold on to heat in a house? Какви трикове може да използваме, за да задържим топлината в къщата си? K-glasses. K-glasses. K-glasses? That's like double glazing or triple glazing. Double glazing with shift the soil through with layer, special layer. Uh-huh, to stop. To stop the infrared rays into the house. Yeah. So there's... Yeah, so there's double and triple glazing where you can put um, a film one side so it allows it, um, it allows it to come in but stops it from going back out again. What else could we do? How else can we hold on to heat inside the house? Okay, some people saying thermal mass here. Someone's got their hand up. Do you want to? Heat absorbing material type water or stuff. Heat absorbing material, so thermal mass. So thermal mass can be any solid body that slowly absorbs heat and slowly releases heat. Термомасата може да е всякакво тяло, което е твърдо и поема топлината, нагрява се и после бавно я отдава. So water is one of the best holders, one of the best materials for holding on to heat. И водата е един от най-добрите материали, които задържат топлината. But earth is also a very good thermal mass. Но земята също е много добра термомаса. So you can... So when you're designing, you can understand, you can think about well, where does the sun come from in the winter? How can I get it to hit some kind of a thermal mass so that it heats up during the daytime when the sun's there, and then when the sun's gone, it slowly releases this heat back out. So that's just one very, very simple flow. And we can apply this idea of flows to a hundred different energies that pass through our house. Това е пример просто за един от потоците и може да го приложим за многото други различни потоци, които преминават през нашия дом. So we can think about how we make use of it, whether we want to hold on to it, whether we want to let it go. So obviously in the case of heat in the summer is a very different scenario to the heat in the winter. Трябва да помислим каква е енергията, искаме ли да я задържим, искаме ли да се отървем от нея, so the same principles that we can use for growing food for building a house, we can use elsewhere. What other, what other needs did humans have that we could try and apply permaculture to? Този принцип може да приложим и в други сфери. Какви са нуждите на хората, към които можем да приложим пермакулта? What other systems, what other needs do humans have that we can apply this to? Education. Education. Education, fantastic, great one. Okay, let's think about this. So in terms of flows, um, who, who are we educating, first of all? Are we educating children? Are we educating adults? Children, fantastic. So what's the what flows go through in an education system? What what comes in and what comes out? Information. Information. So the flow in education is about information. So where does the information come from? It can come from books, it can come from teachers, from the environment, through observation, from the internet, why not? From experience. 
Where else does information come from? Okay. So information um, is one of the flows. It can come from many, many, many different places. And um, and how do we store on store this information? Okay, so one of the principles of permaculture is to catch and store energy. In this case, catching and storing information. So we've said that information can, can come from a teacher. So if so a teacher is teaching, how does someone store that information? So someone can write it down. How else can you store information? From a camera? Um, and from a mobile phone, even? In your memory. Amazing. Yeah. Where else can we store information? In the memory of others. Fantastic. So a collective memory. Yeah. So the when you're making permaculture designs, you need to be really imaginative and really creative. So for every scenario, you need to just keep thinking, what else, where else, how else, where else could I do this, where else, what else? And go way beyond just the obvious scenarios. So I know so for example, maybe you could back in the old days, maybe carve something out of stone. Maybe you could carve something in wood. It's a memory, it's a picture, it's art, it's whatever. These are all memories, ways of storing information. Okay, give me another principle of permaculture which we can maybe try and apply to education. Share. Um, okay, express that as a as a principle. I'm not I'm not familiar with share in specifically as a principle. Maybe integrate rather than segregate. Integrate rather than segregate. Okay. Okay, so let's apply integrate rather than segregate to education. So, so what is it we're potentially integrating? What is it we're potentially segregating? So people. So how can we collectively, so rather than uh, holding all the information in the mind of one person, if we share this, if we integrate this knowledge of one person in many people, then we've um, integrated this knowledge into multiple people rather than you know, allowing one person to kind of be some kind of prima donna who, oracle or whatever who has all the knowledge. <laughs> That also then relates to resilience. So um, there's a principle, multiple elements, multiple functions. Multiple elements and multiple functions. Which essentially is about resilience. It's about making sure that 
that any system that you have, for every function you need, it's um, achieved by multiple elements in your system. Всяка функция, от която имате нужда, се поддържа от множество елементи във вашата система. Това е издържаемостка вкус. So, for example, if the function of retaining um, knowledge is achieved by one thing, if we retain all of our knowledge just in a on an SD card on a video uh, recorder, what happens if that SD card on the video recorder gets wiped? Например, ако съхраняваме цялата си информация в една SD карта или някакво запрестателно устройство, какво се случва, ако се щупи това устройство? We then lost all of the information because we stored it in one place. Цялата информация се загубва, защото е била съхранявана на едно единствено място. So instead of storing in one place, we record it there. We maybe make a backup of that SD card onto a computer. We maybe put it onto the internet. We also then give this information to other people. Uh, we store it in books, we store it in audio recordings, we store it in our memories. If you record we the same function of storing information, we spread across multiple different elements. Yeah. And we also on the other side of it is for every element that you have in a system, if you can get it to do multiple functions, then again, you, you're creating richness and abundance. Which I'm struggling to think how I can apply to the video card. Uh, I have to explain, by the way, I've just been talking 14 days non-stop. <laughs> so, so I'm a little bit slow on thinking right now. Um, but okay, where else could we maybe, we'll, let's, let's try one other area that we can maybe try applying permaculture to. So we've looked at um, meeting our needs, we've looked at uh, food growing, we've looked at buildings, a little bit about education. Where else can we apply permaculture? Innovation on new technologies. Okay, so first of all, we need to look at what is technology. So technology, in my perspective, is a tool which helps us to achieve a task more simply. So, for me, a technology um, which Okay, so first of all, we need to, I guess, look at what, what is the subject that we are trying to help us with. Now, if the subject is just to make another computer game, or something that is actually relatively meaningless in terms of our ability to thrive and take care of each other, it's not necessarily a technology that I particularly want to put any energy into evolving. Първо трябва да разгледаме за каква технология става дума. Ако искаме просто да създаде някаква игра или нещо, което не е важно, няма отношение към растежа ни, тогава не бихме вложили толкова много енергия в тази технология. There is a technology that could help us to maybe grow food in a more environmentally friendly way or something that helps us to um, to be able, maybe it be able to travel in a more ecologically friendly way uh, to meet some of our needs, that's maybe a, the kind of technology that I'd be more interested in looking at. Ако става дума за технология, която да ни помогне да влежаме храната си по по-еколого-съобразен и природосъобразен начин, или пък да открием начин по който да пътуваме по-природосъобразно, Това би било нещо, в което бих си вложил, бих вложил повече от енергията си. 
So ultimately, you can use the, the ethics to actually filter out which technologies do kind of fit within a permaculture system or meet the ethics of permaculture and which ones do not. И можем да приложим тук етиките на пермакултурата, за да филтрираме а, кои са а, нещата, които отговарят на, на пермакултурните принципи. Okay, you. But from what I heard is you want to try and look at a technology that helps make a more um, environmentally friendly hull for a boat. Is that right? Значи ще разгледаме технология, която се опитва да създаде а, по Okay, so I guess where I would start, if someone gave me a challenge of designing something like that, the first place that I would start is to look at why do I want to make a hull for a boat. So if it's just to carry um, passengers to, so they can have a nice holiday in Jamaica or somewhere, then I'd be thinking, well, is that really Earth Care People Care Fair Share? <coughs> so what is it that you want to carry in these boats? Currently, the experiment was uh, made for sporting boats uh, the, uh, for sailing, but uh, they, uh, if the, it works, they could uh, appeal it uh, for commercial boats. Okay. So, first of all, if someone asked me to invent uh, a system for a sporting boat, uh, I would probably say, so for, this, for recreation, we're going to, what, maybe grow some materials, use huge amounts of land, deforest, our environments and as we know forests are the lungs of our our planet. So to chop down a forest that we can grow some plants which we can then use fossil fuels probably to process in order to make a material that could then allow one person to get from A to B faster than a second person go from A to B, I would say is not earth care, it's not people care, it's not fair share. Did I really say that much? So, so that would be my first take, is that in order, looking at the repercussions of, you know, how much damage we're doing to our environment uh, in order to produce something like that, my first reaction would be not interested. It's not permaculture. So the second idea was about eventually using it for commercial. So maybe moving what food or other commercial products from one part of the world to another part of the world. Even that I would then question, why is that necessary? If we go back to the principle that um, in order to take care of ourselves, all we need is food, water, air, and um, and you know, shelter, protection. And then we need companionship and a sense of self-worth and something that allows us to evolve as human beings. Now, given that I know that I can achieve these locally, 
through, you know, by my, either by growing food myself or by getting a collective of people together so that we, between us, grow our own foods. И ако аз знам, че мога да постигна тези неща или сам, или в общността, в колектива, като заедно отглеждаме храна. Given that I know that I can um, also build a house in such a way where we can take local materials, whether we've got stone, whether we've got clay, whether we've got um, wood. И знам, че мога да построя къща, като използвам само местни материали от местността. Мога да използвам камък, мога да използвам глина. And I know that if we collaboratively come together and help us to all make our own homes. И знам, че можем заедно да се объединим и да създадем своите домове. Given that I know that I can get all the other things such as medicines from my garden. И останалите неща, например, лекарства, могат да вземат да получат градината си. Given that I know I can get companionship and a sense of self-worth by creating a community around me of local people. И като създам общност от хора около себе си, мога да получа партнерство, приятелство. I'm not really sure what it is that I need to import from so far away across the world and why I would need to chop down trees and chop down the heart and the, the, the lungs of our planet. I can't imagine what product it is that I need to move across the world that warrants chopping down so many trees and destroying our planet. Тогава не съм сигурен какво е това нещо, което искам да бъде донесено от другия край на света, от което наистина има нужда и което да оправдае изсичането на гори и така нататък. So it may sound like a real cop-out, but I can't see how I can make a permaculture design for something like that, but I can't actually see a valid end, uh, I can't see a valid need for. Uh, in fact, uh, the real uh, topic was uh, using, uh, using our leftover from agriculture to make composite materials. So, uh, both is one application, but you can also uh, uh, use uh, those new uh, composed compose materials for other things like uh, bu uh, building or uh, mm -hmm. making uh, uh, parts for, 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 uh, for making tanks uh, with the metal. You can use it uh, for several other things. And it's not only for uh, making uh, sporting boats. It's more about uh, making uh, with, with uh, what you have, inventing new uh, composite materials okay. that can fit the uh, units. Okay, great. So. Значи става дума също за опозотворяване на някакви отпадъчни материали и създаването на такъв материал, който може да се използва за отбивка на кораб. Това е само едно от приложенията на този материал. Може да намери и други приложения на този материал. So this is new information, which is quite interesting. Това вече различно. So now I can really start thinking. So, if we've got a waste material from uh, a process that is feeding people, which can then be used to make other products that could also help people, that's far more interesting to me. However, if this is monoculture food growing that the um, that the resources for making this is coming from, that's not what I'm not interested in that. Whereas if it was several communities all coming together, growing their own food in polycultures, and they produced enough material to then be able to use to make this other product, that all of a sudden becomes more interesting. Does everyone know the difference between monoculture and polyculture? Or do I need to explain that? Yeah, lots of nods, great. I mean, we all recognize that having a big monoculture of just one crop in huge areas uh, is so destructive to the environment. 
Всички разбираме, че отглеждането на монокултура в една огромна площ е много разрушително за природата. In order to maintain these systems, we need to use so many fossil fuels, so many chemicals, so many, um, and we lose so much biodiversity that it just, in any way, you cannot imagine how it could ever fit into Earth care, people care, fair share. За да отглеждаме монокултури, използваме толкова много гориво и химикали и взимаме толкова много от богатството на почвата, че това по никакъв начин не се е вписва в етики за грижа за хората, грижа за земята и споделянето за гирето. So where I would, so the way in which I would start thinking about this is if these materials could come from, as I say, small communities who are growing their own food in really nice polycultures, and there is enough material that that community really doesn't need and can't reinvest into their own land to make their land far more fertile and rich. If it really truly is a product that has no other use, then I would start to consider how could I use this for, um, for making something else. И ако става дума за материал, който идва от общности, които сами си отглеждат продукцията и имат такъв излишък от нея, който не могат да инвестират обратно в своята система, за да го покатят, тогава ще започне да мисля как може да се използва този излишък. So, yes, that, that, that would be my take on it. It would be purely looking at what, uh, what materials are really genuinely unusable as opposed to if it's coming from, you know, some kind of Monsanto monster kind of food growing system and how do they get a little bit more green, greenwash, you know, eco, blah, blah, blah. Uh, that I'm not interested in. So it really would have to first of all come down to the basic principles of local communities, local farming, and if there really was a product that really had no other use, and I can't think of it, any food growing system that really can't use its waste system back into its own system. So I'm, I'm not actually sure there really is a product here, to be honest. I'm not sure there really is something that I can design with, in, in my mind, the way that I see, the only way that I see the world really progressing and getting out of the, the, the systems that we're using and we've created to, to destroy ourselves. So. По материала за нашата инновация, за нова технология, идва от замеделието с Монсанто, които се опитват просто да живеят малко по-зелени. Не бих се включил в това, но ако идва от малки общности, които наистина просто не могат да намерят друг начин да използват този материал, но аз всъщност не се сещам за такъв материал, просто начинът по който аз разсъждавам, винаги намира начин да намира приложения на излишка. As a permaculture designer, my first and primary client is Planet Earth. Като пермакултурен дизайнер, моят първи и основен най-важен клиент е Планетата Земя. If a human being comes to me and says, I want you to do this on my land, I want you to design this. And what they're asking me to do, I don't feel is actually going to create richness to the land, but is actually going to exploit the land, then as far as I'm concerned, I'm not interested in working for that client. Но ако усети, че това, което човека иска от мен да направя, няма да доведе до обогатяване на средата, а всъщност ще я реши от нещо, няма да поема ангажимента. So my strategy is, first of all, is to try and explain to the client that if you want a, a food growing system that is going to destroy the planet, you, it cannot be a permaculture system and I'm not interested in doing that. Първата ми задача е да обясня на клиента, че ако иска да направя нещо, което ще разруши, ще навреди на природата, това не е пермакултура и не мога да го направя. But if you're interested in really truly creating richness and abundance for all animals, all insects, for other human beings, and producing food or some kind of product, um, then, and it really truly genuinely takes care of the earth, then I'm interested. That's permaculture. 
Но ако искате да създадете изобилие и да се погрежите за, за всички същества, за насекоми, за животни, а, при, получавайки храна, например, отвеждайки храна, това наистина е кърна култура. I walked away from clients who offered me really good money to make a design for an island, um, which, as far as I could see, they were just looking to exploit. But they were looking to put some greenwash onto their project, onto their nice eco-touristic place. They were just looking to make it look green, but underneath it was purely exploitation. Uh, имах клиент, който искаше да направя пермакултурен дизайн на един остров, uh, но аз видях, че всъщност те искат да експлуатират uh, земята и просто да, да се престорят за зелени. Но във всъщност тази това беше експлуатация. As a permaculturist, as a human being, I can't ever put my name or my ideas or my thoughts to something like that. И като пермакултурист, и като просто човек, аз никога не мога да поставя мето си под нещо такова. So, yeah, so as I say, my first and primary client is planet Earth. Because if we don't take care of this Earth, then it cannot take care of us. Първият ми най-важен клиент е планетата Земя, защото ако не можем да се грижим за нея, то тя не може да се грижи за нас. As we know, the thresholds for what allows life to exist on this planet is quite thin. You know, which is why we can research millions of stars and planets around the, the galaxy and as far as I know, I don't think we found even one that has all of the components that allows life to exist on it. Може да изследваме други планети, но доколкото знам, не сме открили дори една, която да има всички нужни компоненти, за да съществува живот на нея. This planet really is a phenomenally amazing place. Нашата планета не е феноменално удивително място. And it's existed for so long in in some form of harmony. It's had lots of ups and downs, but it's lived and it's created an ecosystem that can now support such an amazing variety of life. But there's one animal on this planet that for some reason seems to think that it's progress to destroy the very System that affords it the, the that gives it the ability to actually survive on this planet. We know the statistics. We know the damage that we're doing to our planet. Our eyes are open. We know what we're stepping into. And as far as I'm concerned, in future generations, future generations can look back at us and say, you were the generation that had all of this information, knowing how much you were destroying the planet. And there's two ways we can go. Future generations can either look back at us and say, you were the generation that ignored that. You carried on living selfishly. You carried on living thinking only about yourself. You carried on thinking, there's nothing I can do. It's not my problem. It's someone else's problem. The governments will fix it for us. Вие не направихте нищо, вие си мислите, че нищо не зависи от вас и че управниците ще оправят проблемите. Future generations can either look at us and say, you did absolutely nothing. You just stood there and watched and did nothing. You were so greedy. How on earth? What kind of how could you call yourself human beings? Могат да 
да ни кажат нищо не направихте, бяхте егоистични, толкова алчни, как, как, как го направихте? Как може да се наричате човешки същества? Как ти да направи нищо и знаеш, че нашата генерация ще трябва да съфра с your inaction, because of your inaction. Как успях, как можахте да го направите, като знаете, че сега нашето поколение ще страда заради вашето бездействие? Or they could look back at us and say, wow. Under all these odds, from all these pressures, from governments, from big business, and under all these pressures, you stood up and you did something. You guys are amazing. Или бъдещите поколения може да се обърнат към нас и да ви кажете, вау, през цялото това напрежение от бизнеса, от управниците, вие въпреки това се отточихте срещу тях и направихте нещо удивително. It's not just wow, it's wow! Wow! You guys did something! Вие постигнете нещо голямо. Which would you rather have? How would you like people to look back at our generation? Wow! Wow! So we are the genera- we are in such a privileged position. We have the tools, we have the knowledge, we have a way to get out of this. We just need to get together. We need to work together, we need to collaborate. And we can and we really are gonna start this. In fact this revolution has started. The fact that there's so many people, I don't know how many people are here, there's what? 50, 60, 70, 80, I have no idea. More than 120. More than 120 people are here to listen to me. Who am I? <laughs> We are the revolution. The more we start working together, the more we start collaborating, we can do really amazing things. The revolution doesn't have to be with blood and guns and war. That's the old style revolution. This revolution comes from the heart. This revolution comes from compassion towards each other, towards ourselves, towards fellow humans, towards our other animals and insects, towards compassion towards the whole world. Идва от състраданието един към друг, от състраданието към животните, към всички същества, към целия свят. When I started talking about these kinds of things 20 years ago, people looked at me and called me a troublemaker. They called me a lunatic. <laughs> they said, you're a trouble. There's no way that the world will ever run out of resources. There's no way that there will ever be economic uh, problems. That We'll solve that with technology. There's no, you're just scaremongering. Казваха, че няма начин на ресурсите да се изчерпат, няма начин на економиката ни, економиката ни да не се развива. Все ще се спрем някакъв, нали имаме технология. And it's incredible how when you met someone who you could talk to, who didn't call you a lunatic, you would spend days and days, you wouldn't sleep, you wouldn't eat because you just needed to talk and realize that you're not actually mad. <laughs> but now look, now I can go all over the world, I can go to and I meet amazing people like you everywhere. А вижте сега, аз пътувам по целия свят и срещам невероятни хора като вас. So this revolution has started. Така че революцията вече е започнала. We just need to keep it going. Просто трябва да я поддържаме. And I need to start asking you some questions. What is it you want to know? И сега... Or oh, should we, do we want to take a break first? Sorry. Искате ли почивка? Should we take a break and then questions? Yeah. Okay, there's only one toilet, so quickly. Well, or maybe I should go first. This is your chance. So who has a question? Are money a sustainable mechanism? 
is money. Yeah, is money a sustainable? Okay, what is money? Money is a, a energy exchange. Yeah. It, it's just a tool to help us um, to meet our needs. And in order to have some kind of fair exchange of of energy so that we can meet our needs. So if we're talking about the, the current economic models that we're using, given that the majority of the money is in the hands of the few who control how and where the rest of us can get access to this money and how we can use it, I would say that is absolutely not fair share. And so while an economic system only takes care of the minority and does not meet the needs of the majority, it has to fail at some point. So, what I would say is a economics and money itself isn't a problem, but the system and how it's being used is a huge problem. I remember when I was really young, maybe 12 years old, I kind of looked at how economic systems worked and was thinking, and I, I don't know where I got this idea from at such a young age, but I realized how the kind of, the, and do you mind if I swear? So I'm, I'm really, uh, I'm getting tired and my natural tendency is to swear. But I, I kind of noticed how the, the way in which the economic system is structured is that it's all about taking care of the middle classes. And how the middle classes, if you take care of the middle classes, and get them to shit on the lower classes, then it's ha and, and basically the, the upper classes basically shit on the middle classes, and the more that the middle classes tolerate that and accept what the middle classes or what the upper classes put pressure on them to do in order to manage and manipulate the lower classes, the more shit they tolerate, the more the stable the system becomes. That makes sense. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Maybe to put this a slightly different way, the middle classes are basically uh, their role is to shit on the lower classes. <laughs> and the more successful they are at shitting and keeping the lower classes um, in control, then the less the upper classes will shit on them. <laughs> so as long as you take care of the middle classes, the middle classes will keep putting pressure on the lower classes and stopping the lower classes from actually rebelling and fighting back and saying, fuck you, we're not going to to tolerate anymore. So 
to say, at the age of, I don't know, something like 12, I kind of figured this out, and I, figured, I was thinking, so, in order to really create a revolution, all we need to do is really make the middle classes realise that they, um, they hold the real power, and if they are not taken care of, if we can show that they're, uh, I'm losing my words here, if they, if we can embed ethics into the middle classes to say, actually, I'm not going to tolerate having to shit on people below me in order for me to survive. The more we can work with the middle classes and get them to start thinking ethically, that's where the real revolution is. Това, което трябва да направим е да накараме средната класа а, да приеме етично поведение и да, да си каже, че а, не ми харесва това да злоупотребявам с ниските класи. So from an economic perspective, if we can if we can show the middle classes or if we can set up or if the middle classes stop being taken care of if the middle classes can no longer afford to live, they can't afford to eat, they can't afford to have their houses, they can't afford their luxuries, then automatically there's no interest in them continuously having to have all the pressure of having to, uh, I can't think of any other way to put it, other than shit on people below them. Uh, you know, how can you, as an honest, ethical person, really accept that you're making your li living, you're making your livelihood by shitting on other people, by exploiting others, whether it's directly or whether it's exploiting people in other parts of the world. So if we can uplift the mentality and bring ethics into the middle classes to start thinking about how, in order for them to make their livelihoods, they can take care, you know, that they do it in such a way that they actually genuinely take care of the lower classes, that for me is, is the most exciting part. That, that for me is where the revolution is happening. И ако можем да внушим тази етика на средна на хората от средната класа, за да могат те да отговарят да посрещат нуждите си, но по начин, по който се държат също и за хората от по-нишите класи, това е всъщност нещо, което трябва да направим. What I'm noticing in places like Greece, in places like Iceland, in places, you know, various places around the world, these middle classes are no longer being really taken care of. They're really struggling to really take care of themselves. And so for me, this is a really, really, really exciting time. Because in that confusion, in that insecurity, that's where we can start working. За хората от средната класа е много трудно да посрещат нуждите си. So for me, this is a really, really exciting time, and we can start looking at alternative economic systems. I mean, ultimately, money is just, as I say, an energy exchange, and if we look at what energies is it we need to exchange, we can realise there are so many more rich ways in which we can make these exchanges other than just cash. In Brixton, for example, where I used to do a lot of work, we've got the Brixton Pound. It's a currency that is only valid and you can only spend it in Brixton. If you take it out of Brixton, you come over the river to Victoria or Westminster or somewhere, and you try and spend this, it's worth nothing. And so the advantage of this is that 
everything that is bought and all the trade that happens in Brixton, all the profits of it stay in Brixton. It stays with people who live in Brixton. Предимството на това е, че всяка покупка, която се направи и всяка печалба остава в рамките на Брикстън и за хората на Брикстън. Представете си една кофа с много дубки. Приливате вода. And the water is going to just leach out of this bucket again and again. And you can put your fingers in a few, but you can't put it in um, every single hole. <coughs> Putting your economic money into a system where the profits of these do not stay in your local community, but go out to you know pay for some yacht in the Caribbean or wherever. И ако влагаш, влагаш парите си а, за нещо, печалбата, от, кои, от което не остават а, в общността, а примерно отиват за някой да си плати яхта, за някъде си. Having that money leave your system and go somewhere outside of your country. Ако парите напуснат а, твоята система и отидат някъде в чужбина. Ultimately weakens your economy. Това а, без съмнение отслабва економиката. It means you, the people within the country have less and less economic wealth to be able to make real exchanges for themselves. So having a local currency that is only um, that can only move around within the community basically builds up richness in your community. It also means that you know all of the people who are personally benefiting from those exchanges. <laughs> so local currencies really stimulate community. It takes care of, you know, in order to buy things or make things, you have to buy your resources or get your resources locally. So ultimately, it it helps your local economy, it helps your local ecology, um, and it makes sure that you keep everything in a kind of closed loop system. So you can only take out of the system what the system can genuinely give to you. Местната валута държи печалбата в системата и може да си сигурен, че има затворена циркулация. Нищо не излиза от системата. It prevents you from getting the majority of your resources from outside of your system and having to put it in. And obviously the more energy you have to, or the more resources you have to put in from outside of your system, the more energy is required to actually keep that system going. And therefore it becomes more and more expensive. But the more you keep it local, all the products start to become cheaper and cheaper because they're local materials. <coughs> but there are lots of other uh, economic systems as well. So there's gift economy. There's um, I mean, gift economy is really simple. It's you know uh, those who can afford um, exchange either money or gifts or anything in exchange for whatever they they need. And while it may sound counterintuitive, it's actually a very rich way to exchange and meet your needs. Економика с даряване, в която а, обменяш пари а, или пък а, някакъв дар за нещото, от което имаш нужда. И може да ви звучи парадоксално, но това работи доста добре. It takes a real shift of consciousness, though, to actually create a gift economy. Но е нужна промяна на съзнанието, за да се създаде такава економика на даровете. Because the current economic system that we've engaged with is an economy of scarcity. <coughs> it 
it teaches us that actually money is really, really precious and it's a, it's a really scarce commodity and we have to think very, very carefully about how we spend it, otherwise we won't have enough to take care of our needs. So when people engage from a system like this in a gift economy, they're coming at it from the perspective of scarcity. Ooh. Ooh. They need a thousand euros to make this workshop happen. And they're saying that I can give whatever I like. Okay, I'll give five euros towards that, because that's, that's my gift. But the system isn't going to work if people give from scarcity. Whereas if you recognize... Та когато идваш от нагласа, от нагласата, която имаш в нашата економическа система и се променяш нагласата си за тази економическа система на дарове, ти имаш усещане за недостиг. И, например, знаеш, че можеш да отидеш на това събитие и да дариш колкото прецениш и даряваш само 5 евро, защото имаш това усещане за недостиг. Whereas if you come from the perspective of abundance and you think beyond just money as being the only means of exchange. It's incredible how many gifts each of us have to give. It's amazing how many gifts each of us possess and can exchange. For those who maybe speak another language, a translation is a skill. For someone who can't read, having someone else read for you is a skill and a gift that you can exchange. For someone who has physical disability, someone who has that ability is a, is a skill and a gift that can be exchanged. For someone who knows how to grow food for something uh, is a skill you can exchange for someone who doesn't know how to grow their own food. I guarantee you, if I gave you a form with a hundred potential skills that can be exchanged, I guarantee you the majority of you would be able to fill at least 50 to 80 percent of that and say, yeah, I can do that. And all of these skills and all of these gifts can be genuinely exchanged with other people in order to make a strong community and it create a, a financial or a, an exchange system. И всички тези умения могат да бъдат искрено обменени, за да се създаде друга економическа система. So the way I see economies moving is I see economies moving more to local economies. I see more things along the lines of whether it's time banks, whether it's let schemes, whether it's gift economies, but being much more flexible. И аз виждам развитието на економическата система към развитие на местна економика, дали това ще са time bank или пък тази економика на дарове. And using big global banks as being only for resources that, and for like national resources and international resources that have nothing to do with meeting our basic, normal, na uh, local, basic needs. Uh, and our basic, no our basic needs can be met locally. And so we don't need a big economic system to actually support that. А големите международни банки, тази голяма економическа система, да е само за да е само за да може нуждите, да базовите си нужди да ги посрещаме в в общността местно, 
а, това, което не ни засяга пряко, това вече да е работа за големите банки. That's not how I see economics, but that's my opinion. I saw a hand go up in the back. I saw a hand go up in the back. Did someone want to ask a question? It doesn't matter already. It doesn't matter already. It's a good question. So you talk about the importance of um, starting communities. What would you say is a kind of process? How did we? How can we go about starting communities using permaculture? Въпрос е за това как да започнем общност, да стартираме общност с пермакултура, как да използвам пермакултура. So any successful community or any successful project um, is only successful if there is first of all a, co a really common vision which is common and commonly agreed between everyone who wants to be part of that. Всяко успешно нещо е успешно, защото има хора, които са на едно мнение. So the first step is to create common vision. Та първата работа, първата стъпка е да се създадем обща визия. I teach um, there's a guy education program called Eco Village Design. Има образователна програма, нарича се Eco Village Design. And within that it's looking at how eco communities can come together and build resilient long term communities. Там се разглежда как да се съберат такива общности и да да създават дълги и устойчиви връзки. And the most essential part of starting that community is about having as I say a common vision. И най-важната стъпка е да се създаде обща визия. Without that, you're pretty much guaranteed that your community will fall apart. So, for example, if I said that I want to start an eco village, and I said, who's interested in coming to and joining my eco village? Who's interested in joining any coverage? village? <laughs> Alright, cool. So imagine, I, that's my starting point. We're starting an eco village and let's, let's buy land. We all need 500 euros each to buy this land and off we go. And I've seen this happen many, many, many times, especially in Croatia, where I've spent a lot of time. So everyone puts their money in, they buy the eco village on the premise that we're making an eco village. And then then they actually have to start doing something. So the first person says, right, okay, so I want my house here and I want that there and we build a communal house there. And other people start saying, yeah, great. Uh, yeah, I love the idea of the communal village and, you know, of communal space. And yeah, I'm happy to build my house there. I'm happy to do that there. И други казва, да, много ми харесва идеята да си имаме общностен център, общо място и съм окей, зажадвам се, че там ще ми е къщата, другото нещо ще е там. And what I'd also like is I would like my abattoir over in that corner there. Abattoir, where you kill pigs. О, но искам паницата ми да е ето там. And also, what do you mean an abattoir? But this is a vegetarian community. <laughs> no, you never said that. You said it's an eco village. In my, in my eco village, we have pigs and we kill pigs. <laughs> but what do you mean? No, no, no. In my version of an eco village, it's strictly vegetarian. How can we? No, we can't kill pigs. <laughs> So this conflict happens because we didn't have a clear vision. 
we didn't say at the beginning that uh, this eco village is strictly vegetarian, no alcohol, no smoking, blah 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 blah. We didn't set out a very clear vision as to what this eco village was about. So the other side of this is you see um, the first person say, this is my, my vision of an eco-village. It will be smoke-free, there will be no alcohol, everyone will do meditation, etc, etc, etc. And essentially what they end up creating is a dictatorship. And typically, and I've seen this again and again, they'll say, but there's no rules in my eco-village, you can come do whatever you like in my eco-village. We believe in anarchy, we believe in self-rule, that we can all make the right decisions for ourselves. So people end up thinking, wow, great, yeah, I love this idea, anarchy, we can really truly take care of ourselves because we can trust ourselves to make the right decisions. So you go ahead and you start doing something. And then the person who instigated this community said, you can do anything except for that. We've got no rules, but that is absolutely wrong. You can't do that. And then something else comes up, and you can do anything except for that as well. So it's only this and that you can't do. And that, no, no. You can't do that, you can't do that, you can't do that, but we've got no rules in our community. And so, obviously, people start to get, well, I'm sorry, but this is just nonsense, and they walk away, and you end up with pure dictatorship. So the way to create a rich community is, first of all, the person who has the idea, they share their idea. This is what I, I would love to have an eco-community which is strictly vegetarian, vegan even, no drugs, no alcohol, no smoking. That's what I would like. I would like our community to be able to build homes from local resources. I would like our community to live by permaculture ethics. And so on and so on. So, forth. so you share your, your, your personal dream of what you would like the eco village to be like. But then you need to completely let your dream go. And find out from others what's your dream. So rather than this being my dream, what I want to know is how do I turn my dream into our dream? Dream. So how is it I turn, um, make and realize my dream, but in a way that also meets and takes care of all of your dreams? And there are some really great tools to help you to do this. Има удивителни инструменти, които могат да ви помогнат да постигнете това. 
Dragon Dreaming is a really amazing tool that helps you to, to get this collaborative kind of vision. Такъв инструмент, който ви помага да постигнете обща мечта е Dragon Dreaming. Драконско, драконски мечти. Sociocracy is probably for me one of the most exciting tools to help you create a collaborative decision and go beyond that, not just about making a collaborative vision, but also about how you continue a project and make really rich decisions for your community which really take care of all the community. А, защото тя а, ти помага да превърнеш своята мечта в обща, да, да направиш а, визията, да, да стигнете до една обща визия. So now to create this community using these tools, what you may find is that some people's dreams are so opposite to each other that actually they should not be in the same dream, that there should actually be two very separate projects. И тройки този инструмент може да се окаже, че мечтата на някои хора е толкова различна от вашата мечта, че всъщност трябва да се заведе две, да реализирате две отделни мечти. So for example, if my dream is to be strictly vegetarian or even strictly vegan, to have someone in my community who is convinced that actually it's okay to, to raise an animal, torture it, butcher it, there's always going to be difficulties there. Ако например, аз смятам, и аз съм съм стрикна вегетарианец или веган, а има човек, който смята, че окей, с това, окей да гледаш живота, след това да го убиеш, а нашите визии са просто две различни визии. So it may be obvious that actually we need to separate and make two very distinct projects. И очевидно, че трябва да отделим двата проекта и да ги развием отделно. One of the most common mistakes that people make when creating a community is they think, okay, well, he's got the money, and we really need the money to actually get this project going. Okay, so he needs meat. It will be okay. So we need his their money more than I mean, we were able to kind of tolerate that they have a very different ethic to us. And these are what we call time bombs because eventually this time bomb will explode in your face. Now that doesn't mean that the two separate projects can't collaborate and work with each other in certain ways. <coughs> But the, the key thing is that for your closest community in order to enrich your life you want people who are at least of a similar not necessarily identical, but at least with a similar mentality, with similar ethics. So when you're creating your dream, the idea is to get as close a dream as possible within the bounds of your limits. And if your limit is You know, if your limit, if your limit is, you know, vegetarian, no drinking, no alcohol, you know, uh, no smoking, etc., etc., and you really cannot tolerate um, anything beyond that, then, you know, that's your limit. But if you can, okay, I can tolerate someone drinking occasionally, yeah. But that's your decision. You need to make that decision as a community. И ако твоята мечта е да не да не се пие алкохол и така нататък, не трябва да допускаш хора, които имат различна етика. Но ако смяташ, че можеш да толерираш някои от тези неща, 
можеш да допуснеш. So the first step in creating a successful community is having a really clear vision and making sure that the right people are in that community. The next major thing that, um, that causes projects to fail, community projects to fail, is when people don't have the opportunity to truly express themselves. But express themselves. They can't express, they don't have the opportunity to express themselves. So I've lost my thread now. So in order so you need to have some kind of mechanism which allows people to truly express themselves but in a regenerative, creative way. I mean you can express yourself, say you're fucking ugly, mate. You know what I mean? I mean, how is that actually going to create good feelings and good, you know, it's truly expressing yourself, maybe, but it's not regenerative, it's not rich, it's not actually going to, you know, create empathy towards each other. So finding tools that allow you to express yourself in a way that actually encourages and actually um, creates bonds and creates you know, and relieves tension, but really regenerates and um, I'm losing my English words now, but really creates richness between each other rather than just criticizing each other is a really invaluable tool. Много е важно да се открият инструменти, които ни позволяват да, да се изразяваме, но по, а, по позитивен начин. А... And having tools which basically, or being, having the ability to express yourself also prevents tension growing inside. You know, not being able to express is kind of like building up, building up, building up, building up, building up, and then eventually, it's going to explode. And the next major thing, as I say, is about having a tool which allows you to make really rich collaborative decisions. Следващото нещо, от което имаме нужда е инструмент, който ни помага да взимаме общи решения заедно. And there's lots of tools to do that, but for me, sociocracy really is the number one tool for making collaborative decisions. How are we doing for time? Do we have much more time for other questions? We have 20 minutes. We have 20 minutes. Oh, it's question at the back. Yeah, I got one question. So, if we basically make this equal community, uh, so for example, somebody else wishes to join it, uh, how can you deny him for joining this community? Like, like uh, you have a village, you have like 20 houses, and then one guy just buys some land and wants to build a house there or something like that. Okay, in... Okay, in sociocracy, uh, the way sociocracy works is first of all you have a really clear uh, vision, mission and aim. And anyone who um, participates in the project has to agree to, in fact, they've probably been part of creating that vision, mission and aim in the first place. So 
So anyone who later on joins the project, who wasn't part of creating that first vision, mission and aim, they have to agree to it. Because all decisions are based on whether the proposal helps you to achieve your vision, mission and aim, it allows you to go in that direction or whether it takes you away from it. Защото всички предложения, всички решения, които се взимат, се преценяват спрямо това дали решението ще ни помогне да достигнем крайната си цел или всъщност ще ни отклони от нея. So the vision, mission and aim is absolutely central to get right and to make sure that everyone who participates in it is truly 100% behind and truly agrees with that vision, mission, mission and aim. Това е много важно всеки да се да е съгласен с визията и целта. So someone who's joining the project after that's been created, they have to agree with it or at least have the opportunity if there's something they can do to evolve and make that vision, mission and aim even richer, they have to have the ability to do that. И всеки който се присъединява след това трябва да се съгласи с вече установените визия и цел или пък да може да допринесе за доразвиването им. So, for example, if someone comes in and has some new knowledge that the original uh, community didn't have, which actually helps the community to become even richer and better, they have, should have the ability to present that to the community and as long as everyone consents to it and agrees that it does make it better, then they adjust their vision, mission and aim. И ако той да е нов човек, който носи ново знание, което не е било познато на хората от общността, хората могат да го приемат и той да го принесе за обогатяването на общността и за развиването на визията. So basically, it allows people from the outside to come in and join the project, but to ensure that either they they totally 100% agree with the vision, mission and aim, or that they can also evolve the vision, mission and aim. So all decisions from then on are all aimed at making sure that you achieve and you work and walk in the direction of that new vision, mission and aim. So in other words, it's truly organic, it grows, it changes, it mutates, it evolves and it becomes stronger and stronger and stronger. Става дума за органичен растеж, за развитие, за създаване на по-силна и по-силна общност. So that's how I would make sure that that I can get new people coming into the project, but making sure that you still maintain the harmony and coherence within a project. По този начин може да приемаме външни хора, но да сме сигурни, че хармонията, разбирателството ще са поддържени. But we're going to talk a lot more about sociopathy tomorrow. So, any other questions? How do you resolve conflict with the community? Uh, so, the other question is So, it depends on what the conflict is about. It's like different from the uh, vision and mission life. For example, somebody wants something, the other person doesn't want it. Or more, more visual. You see, I think I'm doing more work than you, and you're just eating. Conflict, for example, if it's a visit, it's something. For example, if it's a conflict, it's a conflict. For example, if it's a conflict, it's a conflict. For example, if it's a conflict, it's a conflict. For example, if it's a conflict, it's a conflict. For example, if it's a conflict, it's a conflict. For example, if it's a conflict, it's a conflict. For example, if it's a conflict, it's a conflict. В социокрацията всеки човек има много ясно определена роля. So if, it, if the issue is that someone feels someone's doing too much work or too less work, и ако проблема е в това, че някой си мисли, че един човек върши повече работа, друг човек върши по-малко, that can first of all be addressed by the actual role description and by a performance review. 
това може да се свери с описанието на ролята и с преглед на постижението на човека на... And the performance review in a sociocratic process is done in such a way that the person themselves actually manages and facilitates the performance review. The person themselves actually manages their own performance review. And so they will try and find ways in which they can do their job better. И трябва да намери начини, по които да прави и да върши работа да си по-добре. They will recognize where maybe they're not doing as much as they could and give some ideas as to why it is they can't do. Maybe their job description doesn't actually allow them to do the best job that they could do. Ще открие къде им не върши това достатъчно добре. И може би ще се окаже, че самото описание на работата му не му позволява да се представя достатъчно добре. So maybe they actually need to modify their actual role description to actually allow them to do the job that they want. Or maybe they're just in the wrong job. Може би ще се наложи да модифицират описанието на ролята си или пък може би просто вършат неподходяща работа. And in terms of people just wanting something, again, it's to do with the vision, mission and aim. Is if you having something helps to achieve the overall vision, mission and aim, then it's only logic that, you know, it's based on logic. If it, it either does or it takes you away from your vision, mission and aim. So if you're trying to do something that actually isn't good for the community, then... <coughs> It's logic that you're doing something wrong, and therefore, if you've agreed to live by this system, then it's clear which party is in the wrong. But who decides? Is it good or is it not good? Do you take like communal decision, or one person says this is good, this is not good? You've. Да, има само два варианта. Или вършиш нещо, което допринася за постигането на целта и визията, или пък не. И въпросът е сега как, кой да определя кое е правилно за постигането и кое не е. You have all collaboratively created the vision, mission and aim. So you collaboratively know what it is that you want to achieve. Всички заедно сте създали визията и целта и всички заедно знаете какви са те как да се постигнат. So when a proposal is put forward of, you know, like whether it's a conflict or whatever it is, when a proposal is put forward, it's actually quite logical as to whether, okay, if someone wants to, I want to do it this way, someone else wants to do it that way, you evaluate, well, does doing it this way actually get us there or take us away from it? And if... And if going that way, you know, again, you evaluate, does going that way help us get towards it or take us away from our goal? And if both ways are good, if both ways are um, appropriate, then Essentially what you're doing is you're, you're looking for a way that is, and you, you ask two simple questions. Is it safe to try and is it good enough for now? So if, um, if one is really clear, this helps us, that doesn't help us, then it, it's a no-brainer. This is the way that we take because that way is going to take us away from where we want to be. If both are valid, then the only decision you can make is which is the safest option to try. And as long as it's good enough for now, then you and there's no logical reason as to why the one that is proposed 
takes you away from it, then that's the proposal that gets accepted. That's, that's the solution that gets accepted. Having said that, if the person who wanted to do it the other way is still nervous and still doesn't believe that this is the right way, you can put some checkpoints into the system. Ако това не устройва човека, който е първи е дал предложението за промяна и той още е нервен по тази тема, може отново да премине, отново да има предложение обсъждане. So for example, you can say, well, first of all, every single proposal only ever has, uh, always has a time limit. So no proposal is set in stone. So at some point it always has to be reviewed. So if the person who wants to do it in the opposite direction is still nervous, what you can say to them is, how about you watch this process, keep an eye on it, and if at any point you feel it's dangerous, it's not working, feed it back to us and we'll review it again. И ако човек, който смята, че трябва да се тръгне в другата посока, все още е нервен и недоволен, може да му кажете, наблюдавай и този процес, следи го и ако в тази момент усетиш, че има някаква опасност, упърни се към нас, изрази го. So ultimately, it's the, whoever, is in, uh, whoever is in charge of whatever decisions are being made, it's the group that makes that decision. But each person has the ability to check, to make sure that that is the right decision and change it if necessary. I mean, if it's a personal issue, I just don't like the color of your hair or your nose is too big or whatever, that's a totally different story. That's a personal issue. But if it's about um, moving forward as a, as a community, then, and doing things together, sociocracy works perfectly. Um, if it's a personal issue, then there are other conflict resolution tools. <laughs> Но ако става дума за различия по отношение на развитието на общността, социокрацията е подходящ инструмент. Okay, all of that sounds great for like small communities. How you can apply that for on a bigger scale? Това звучи супер за малки общности, но как може да се приложи в по-голям масштаб? So the way sociocracy works is it works and actually really we're going to cover this tomorrow. So I'm not sure, should we? But it works very, very quickly. It works in small circles of interest, which are all interconnected. So information can flow between bigger and smaller communities. Anything getting back to permaculture? Or well, maybe we don't need to do tomorrow's talk. Maybe I can just go and lie down instead. <laughs> Any permaculture questions? Как може то по любимите, примерно, растения и това да се гледат в нашия район? Това е тайна. Примерно, и Португалия, такива, как може да се приспособят към? Plants that are typical for the warmer climates, like bananas. Here, how can you grow them here? So what's the secret? Sorry. He said, what's the secret? What's the secret? How to grow things that shouldn't grow in this climate? Yes. How to grow tropical things in our climate? How to grow things that shouldn't grow in this climate? Yes. How to grow things that shouldn't grow in this climate? Yes. So what I would say is, first of all, why do you want to grow something that inherently shouldn't grow here first? But what, but what I would say is what you can do is there is a certain amount of threshold of where you can create a microclimate. 
So you can change and create a microclimate that changes the normal bandwidth of your current climate, which means that a certain subset of plants become uh, it becomes possible for them to grow that in this environment. Да създадеш условия, за да може дадените растения да живеят в климата. Okay, so you can create a microclimate. So, for example, for example, if if a plant needs more moisture, ако растението има нужда повече влага, so a, a tropical plant will need more moisture, uh, but it still needs a lot of sun. So what you can do is you can create some kind of uh, a system which traps in heat. As well as trapping in moisture. So for example, you can create a, a, a hedge with trees which basically lock in moisture into the system. You can make sure that you've got big bodies of water which are always on your landscape. So when the sun comes, it hits the water and it evaporates some of it, but it's then, rather than being lost, it's actually captured by the trees that are overhanging it. So that moisture doesn't actually completely leave the system, it gets absorbed by the tree and through uh, evapotranspiration the tree sweats it back out and creates a really nice moist environment. So in the winter, you can then think about um, how do you create how do you create a thermal mass which holds on to heat and releases that heat more slowly. So, for example, big rocks. Uh, but then, I mean, if you're, if you get two meters of snow, you're, I mean, this is, it's not going to work. So there are, there are limits as to how much you can change the microclimate. So it could be that these tropical plants that you're trying to grow, in the summer you can leave it out, but in the winter you need to think about how to cover it, either physically move it, like a... Yeah, so you either physically pick it up and move it into a greenhouse or you put a greenhouse around it. <coughs> and then if you're putting it inside a greenhouse, there's then various tricks that you can use to keep the temperature of the greenhouse warmer in the winter than it would normally want to be. So in the same way when we were discussing about how to uh, keep a house warmer, you could do, use the same tricks of using bodies of water or some kind of thermal mass uh, wall uh, to actually trap heat. Or you can design a system that brings excess heat from some other system through your greenhouse so that it releases the heat into it. So, for example, every time you cook, you release a lot of heat, and if that isn't trapped somewhere, it typically just goes out into the air. So you could design a system that moves that heat, instead of moving it out and losing it in the air, 
but moves it through your greenhouse. <coughs> and one of the most efficient ways of doing that is either to move that heat into water or heat move it into a thermal mass such as a coal, uh, like a, a thermal mass, a compacted coal. So the trick is, how do you move the heat, and how do you, because normally if you look at most, uh, like an, um, an, a wood burning stove, the, the stove, the chimney comes straight out and straight up. <coughs> so it doesn't lend itself to actually moving it sideways so that you can then compact it into some kind of thermal mass. <coughs> So you've got one or two solutions. Either you can, well, in this scenario, you can use the, you can put a pipe on the back of your stove and run water through it, which then goes to a tank, which then heats that tank, and that's what then creates the heat. Or you could create a totally different type of stove which actually has a lot of, which creates a lot of push which can move your heat sideways for a long distance before it then needs to go up and out. And the most efficient way of doing that is what's called a rocket stove. I don't know what more to say. Rocket stoves are really amazing. Yes. <laughs> I have a question for them. Yeah. To run them, you have to use like uh, small sticks. Like you can burn a. You have to chop the wood before burning them, and that's like you have to be all there all the time. Not necessarily. I was in Poland and I was asked to make a rocket stove before a festival. And so we, we made it for this couple of hours. And um, and then they asked me to do a 45 minute talk on permaculture. So we put um, something like six sticks, which were no more than maybe a meter tall, maybe about that thick. Mm -hmm. We put it in there, got the stove going, walked away, I started to do my 45 minute talk. Two and a half hours later, <laughs> I finished talking. <laughs> Came back. <laughs> And when we came back, there was still this much left unburned. I've got photographic proof of it. I mean, even we were shocked at how efficiently it burned this. I would have expected it to have taken maybe an hour, maybe an hour and a half, but we yeah, built it so well, two and a half hours, and there was it still wasn't completely burnt. And I should point out, in this particular design, we had a self-loading design, so the the sticks go in from the top, so when it, it Burns at the bottom, it just keeps dropping in as it gets burnt. Any more questions? When are you going to come teach us design? October. <laughs> Um, so we're looking to do 
Okay, so one of the things that I realised in this region is a lot of the permaculture courses are quite expensive for local people. So the majority of courses that I've noticed here are probably 50 or more percent non-Bulgarians. So what we question. Yeah. So what we're trying what we've been thinking about trying to do is how can we creatively organize a course which is predominantly and I think uh, is predominantly for Bulgarians at a price that you can genuinely afford. We haven't come up with an absolute one hundred percent foolproof scenario yet. Um, but we're looking to see how we can make it happen. So we have a date which is from the 3rd to the 15th of October. And we're calculating how much it's going to cost for food and accommodation. And we're looking at how we can make that really creative, meaning that if people can come with 20 kilos of uh, potatoes and carrots, then how can we adjust? How can we, how can they, that be part of the food and accommodation costs that they don't have to pay? So we're looking at creative ways of how people can pay for the food and accommodation and then we're also looking at how people can pay either on a sliding scale or on a gift economy or various other ways for the actual teaching. So we've got several ideas. One idea is to maybe um, have a, a fixed number, fixed amount of money that we want to achieve. And for then us to for us to then use what we call a magic hat to say, okay, go around, how much do you want to put in the hat? And come back, aha, we've only got half the money we need. Let's go around again. Okay, we're almost there. One more round. Fantastic, we've got exactly what we need, the course can go ahead. That's one option. But within that, there's also flexibility because some of that uh, money can also be gifts. So if someone has something they can offer me, for example, that is worth something really valuable to me, then I'm happy to take that gift instead of cash. So that's one solution, but we're debating as to whether that's actually possible in Bulgaria. So maybe we can use this opportunity to see who thinks that that would be possible. So only two or three. Oh, 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 oh. yeah. Okay. So maybe it's possible. So the idea is that if, for example, we calculate that maybe it's an average of. 120 euros each person needs to put in. We can set it up in such a way that if someone wants to put in 200 euro, another person puts in 50 euro, we don't know who's put how much in, as long as we actually eventually end up with the, you know, the full pot. 
може да направи нещата така, че някой да сложи 200 евро, друг човек да сложи 50 евро. Ние не знаем кое колко е сложил и всичко наред стига в крайна сметка да сме постигнали нужната сума. The question is, would everyone just start his five euros? Но въпрос е дали просто so starting off with this scarcity mentality, if I, if I put in five, hopefully someone else will put in 200. In which case this magic hat is going to be going around for a very, very, very long time. So, that's the key question. So that's one option. What other options have you come up with? Uh, the other option is like uh, we calculate, yeah, uh, the book, 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 и да дойдем известно време преди случването на евента, да има някаква, да, минимална или средна цена. И ние мислихме, че ще бъде най-лесно. Извинява за моя глупост. Ние мислихме, че ще бъде най-лесно, ако хора, които има нещо да предложат, предварително да, ам, да пишат на нас. И така може да разбираме. Е, като Рекеш каза, много хубаво човек да идва с много картофи, но не трябва ми всеки ден да яде картофи, защото всички идва с картофи. Но така не сме оформени, защото не всички чувствам като него, че е много важно за всички да има възможности да участва. Но така за нас да може да организираме такива по-практикални неща, но за всички също да, да има време да мислят, нали? какво аз може да давам и така предварително да говорим и да разбираме за нещата. За това ние сложим и на флая нещо като идея за сена, която е не конкретна и там е наша имейл и после ще пишем и на Facebook по конкретни детели и така като принципти на социокреси да, да разбираме заедно какво ще стане на крайна сметка. Да, добре. И накрая също така, че сме много благодарни на Калуян Гичер за заснемането на събитието и евентуално ще могат хора, които не са били на събитието или си тръгнали по-рано, да го видят. Ще сложим линк в ден, в който създадахме към събитието, а той ще води към YouTube, където Калуян ще качи запис. And then we will be able to get the magic hat for the other one. Yes. The magic hat for the other one. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. The real goal for this course is we want to make it available to as many people as possible who really want this course and not to have money as being the issue that the stopping point from allowing them to come on this course so yeah. we really want to be creative in how we can encourage people to come and not have money as an obstacle so if anyone has any other suggestions we're going to work with this we're going to be thinking about it over the next few days and we'll come up with some kind of creative solution so i'd love to see you there Искаме да съберем възможно най-много хора на курса през октомври и не искаме липсата на пари да е проблема, да е това, което спира някой да се присъедини. Сме отворени за идеи, така че може да споделите с нас към някакъв проблем. Аз съспект, че ще бъде обезсубскрайд. Бъдете бъдете! Act now. See you tomorrow.